Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas, real actioners. This being the holiday season, we're turning to the undisputed best Bruce Willis action movie of all time. No, not that one. This one. The Last Boy Scout. Admittedly, the 1991 action comedy's ties to Christmas are slim, basically relying on a couple of passing references to Satan Claus. This was nonetheless the sixth movie written by Shane Black, set during the Yuletide. I would argue it's also a hyper-violent redo of It's a Wonderful Life, with Willis as a drunken, broken-down, chain-smoking, self-hating, punch-throwing, jig-dancing version of George Bailey. In 1991, Black was on an incredible high, having established the perfect buddy cop formula with Lethal Weapon. Although he wrote the script to work through a really bad breakup, his career was going so well he was paid a record $1.75 million for his last Boy Scout screenplay. It was much darker and closer to what he had envisioned for Lethal Weapon 2, a plan that had been rejected thus ending his time on that classic franchise. But the buddy formula remained, given a film noir polish with Willis as the haggard gumshoe, Joe Hollenbeck. This guy has it rough. And not just because kids are tossing dead squirrels on his head. After catching his supposed best friend in an adulterous affair with his wife, Joe gets mixed up in a sleazy case involving illegal drugs and pro football, sports gambling, a murdered exotic dancer played by a young Halle Berry, and disgraced ex-quarterback Jimmy Dix played by Damon Wayans. The opening scene is absolute madness, and I'm betting anyone who saw it has it burned into memory. Under pressure to score some points to beat the betting odds, a clearly strung out wide receiver. Dude, he's played by Billy Blanks, Mr. Tybo himself, pulls out a gun and starts blasting every defender between him and the touchdown. Ain't life a bitch, he says before turning the trigger on himself to a stunned crowd. Hollenbeck and Dix, which sounds like a folk band from the 60s or something, find themselves squaring off with a Jerry Jones-esque team owner and his psychopathic right-hand man, Milo, played by comedic actor Taylor Negron in a surprisingly frightening performance. While you can see threads to Lethal Weapon embedded everywhere, The Last Boy Scout just as frequently kicks over expectations of the genre, becoming more of a detective movie. Hollenbeck and Dix are both pretty sad and pathetic for most of the film, each weighed down by regrets and personal demons. They get in one another's way more often than not, and get their butts kicked by the baddies all of the damn time. But they're very good at holding grudges and making threats, which always get kept with extreme prejudice. I'm gonna need a light. If you touch me again, I'll kill you. Oh, gotcha. Bum baby! <laughs> oh, baby! Two for two. We got a two for two. <laughs> Uh, poor Kim Coates. This scene, like many in the film, was originally meant to be part of Lethal Weapon, but when it got cut, Black just took it and used it here because it was just too cool not to. Whoever said football is a violent sport had no idea how right they were. A lot of people get shot, stabbed, blown up, 
get their nose broken by well-thrown footballs, or made into chop suey by rotor blades. It's a scene, man. Not quite on a John McClane level, sure, but Joe Hollenbeck's trigger finger stays pretty busy, and that Dick's guy has a cannon for an arm. memorable bad guys were mostly non-existent. Although Taylor Negron's Milo comes pretty close, just for the way he mishandles Joe's kidnapped daughter, played by Scream Queen Danielle Harris. In earlier versions of the script, Milo was even worse and had a much bigger role. The same goes for Noble Willingham as greedy team owner Sheldon Marcone. Black's blistering dialogue needed a director who could keep up. And who better than Top Gun's Tony Scott to give his words a stylistic flourish? Scott was just coming off the one-two punch of revenge and days of thunder. But his fast-paced approach was a prelude to what he would show two years later on True Romance. The combination of Black and Scott was something special, only matched by the surprising chemistry between Willis and Wayans. The irony is that none of it worked during the production itself. The last Boy Scout was racked by problems, which many attribute to too many big egos clashing with one another. Everybody in this movie was at their career peak. The studio wanted one thing out of Willis, coming off the die-hard success, while well, he wanted to try something different. Complaints about producer interference led to Black being forced to do multiple rewrites, which then led to a cut deemed so unwatchable it had to be stitched together in post by multiple editors. In a 2016 interview, Black recalled, quote, I was forced to do more rewriting on that movie than on anything else I've done. There was tremendous pressure from the studio to get Bruce Willis and have this be a follow-up to Die Hard. He was reluctant, and rightly so. This whole movie is about me saving my wife. I just did that in Die Hard. So they said, okay, let's minimize the wife and, and while we're at it, add a big finale. There was a general pressure to somehow make it bigger. End quote. On top of that, Willis and Wayans couldn't really stand one another, which might have played well for their oil and water on-screen chemistry, actually. You could feel the tension between them, and it made for a more legit flick, since all they do is butt heads. Despite studio concerns about the violence, which had initially earned the film an NC-17 rating, The Last Boy Scout was a modest hit with $117 million worldwide. However, it wasn't enough to do much of anything for either Willis or Wayans, who both floundered for years afterwards. Willis stumbled into a success with Death Becomes Her, but wouldn't really get his groove back until Pulp Fiction in 1994. Wayans rebounded with Mo Money and rejoined Black for a cameo as himself in Last Action Hero, but found his greatest success in TV than movies. Years later, Wayans would join a TV series version of Black's Lethal Weapon franchise. The best of the best. You gotta promise to let me go. Bullshit. Give him the key or I'll have you kneecapped. Whoops. Look like nobody gets the money. That's one of those new plastic keys. Get the goddamn key! The kind of tread.
The last Boy Scout sometimes feels like an outlier on Black and Willis's resume. But as you heed the sage-like words of Joe Hollenbeck, recognize there's a reason it's become such a cult favorite. Well, there's not much more to tell than that. Water's wet, the sky's blue. An old Satan Claus, Jimmy, he's out there. And he's just getting stronger. So what do we do about that? Be prepared, son. That's my motto. Welcome back to another edition of The Best Movie You Never Saw. This week, we're continuing our very Shane Black Christmas theme with a look back at Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. This was Shane Black's directorial debut, a comedy thriller which marked star Robert Downey Jr.'s comeback after years of bad press thanks to his very public battles with drug addiction. So dire was Downey's position in Hollywood at the time that he had to audition for the leading role, and indeed, needed a push from his wife, Susan Levin, who happened to work for producer Joel Silver. They all saw something in Downey's line readings and opted to keep the budget a low 10 to $15 million for Warner Brothers in order to cast him. The studio wanted Johnny Knoxville. Imagine. To co-star, they cast another Hollywood actor whose stock was at an all-time low, Val Kilmer, despite the fact that Harrison Ford had very nearly signed on for the part, which would have meant a much larger budget. Now, in this, Downey Jr. plays an ex-con who wins a Hollywood screen test after his fear following a botched robbery is mistaken for method acting. He's paired with a gay private detective appropriately named Gay Perry, and the two wind up embroiled in a very real murder mystery involving a Hollywood leading man played by LA Law's Corbin Burnson, plus Downey's childhood crush played by Michelle Monaghan in a star-making turn. The film was so well received at Warner Brothers that it secured a spot at the Cannes Film Festival where it received a standing ovation. Reviews were enthusiastic, but sadly this did not carry over into box office success, with the film stalling in theaters, only grossing just under 5 million, although it never got a huge release and was something of an art house hit. No matter, the film was seen by the folks at Marvel, with it paving the way for Downey Jr. to sign on as Tony Stark in Iron Man, and the rest, they say, is history. Truth is, I am Iron Man. Even now, Downey Jr. frequently calls Kiss Kiss Bang Bang his favorite film, and sure enough, it was tailor-made for him at this time in his life. Now, Downey Jr. has been extremely clean-cut and controversy-free over the last 15 years now, but the Downey Jr. scene here was still considered something of a live wire, and many doubted he'd ever be able to overcome his past battle with addiction. This is the movie where he showed everyone just how full of shit they really were, and you can tell here that he's hungry. Perry. Hey, Perry, I shot a guy. I never did that before. Perry, listen. He's putting everything he has into the part, and it works well as an underdog. It's a dry run for some of the later films he'd do, but he's more vulnerable here. Michelle Monaghan also became a pretty big star on the basis of her turn here. Nobody had ever really heard of her before. After this movie, she was suddenly a leading lady in big budget studio films. Well deserved, because she's excellent. One person though who didn't get the same boost that Downey Jr. or Monaghan did here is Val Kilmer, and it must be said that his performance is really just as good as Downey's. He's pretty hilarious as the suave, sophisticated Perry, who delights in using people's homophobia as a weapon. See the famous torture scene with his cock gun. Homophobes never check there. The dialogue between the two is sparkling. It's really a shame that they didn't get a whole slew of adventures together, but Downey would be a major, major star within something like 18 months of this hitting theaters. He certainly never forgot Shane Black's faith in him, hiring him to do Iron Man 3, which you guessed it, also takes place at Christmas, as does this. It's something of a Shane Black trademark. In some ways, this is a departure for Black, as it's noticeably the least violent film he ever did, and it can't really be called an all-out action film, although it does have some good gunfights and stuff. Come on! 
At the same time, it's also textbook black, with the same buddy-buddy bickering he trademarked in earlier films like Lethal Weapon, Last Boy Scout, and Long Kiss Goodnight, and which he'd return to in The Nice Guys. I put in one bullet, didn't I? I you put, put a one live one. round in that gun. Oh yeah, there was like an 8% chance. Eight percent? Was it just 8? Eight? 8? Yeah! Who taught you math? math? more, I don't know. Notably, Val Kilmer's portrayal of Gay Perry is the first openly gay action hero in Hollywood history. You know what? 15 years later, there still haven't been many more. The more things change, the more they stay the same. While this was sadly the end of the road for these characters, Black would make the similarly themed The Nice Guy years later another movie, which is a sadly overlooked gem. Luckily, the cult for both seems to be growing, and Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is a great movie. Hi everybody, and welcome back to The Best Movie You Never Saw, and this week we're taking a look at a Christmas classic, The Long Kiss Goodnight, directed by Rennie Harlan and starring his then-wife Gina Davis, alongside Samuel Jackson, Brian Cox, David Morse, and Craig Bierko. And of course, this was famously written by the great Shane Black. In it, a small-town school teacher, played by Gina Davis, with amnesia, discovers she's a deadly assassin being hunted by her former employers. To fill in the blanks, she hits the road with a shady private detective played by Sam the Man, only to discover some secrets are best left buried. Back in the 1990s, the female-led action flick was a rarity. While Sigourney Weaver blasted her way to big box office and an Academy Award nomination with Aliens, and Linda Hamilton got jacked for Terminator 2 Judgment Day, neither of them was able to parlay that success into a slew of action roles, with Hamilton in particular immediately being sidelined in the genre. An exception to the rule, however, was Gina Davis, who at the time happened to be married to Rennie Harlan, one of the best action directors of the era, who also did, of course, Die Hard 2 Die Harder, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. We're all done, Smiley. Come on, get my second thought. Oh! I'm only kidding, come on, come on and Cliffhanger. The two put a ton of money into a big budget pirate flick slash swashbuckler called Cutthroat Island, but that project quickly spiraled out of control when the original leading man, Michael Douglas, bailed and they had to settle on a much less established name for the male lead, Matthew Modine. The budget, which involved lots and lots of shooting on the water, which is always a disaster, spiraled out of control and eventually bankrupted the studio, Corolco, earning a measly $10 million at the box office against a $100 million budget. Undeterred, however, they went right back into action again with The Long Kiss Goodnight, based on a red-hot script by Shane Black. And this time, the shoot went well, with them bringing it in at a relatively reasonable $65 million. Sadly, residual bad vibes off of Cutthroat Island seemed to doom this despite respectful reviews and a strong cinema score rating. It topped out at a poor $33 million domestically. Of course, it was nowhere near the disaster Cutthroat Island was, although collections were much better worldwide, bringing the total to $89 million and change. Years later, it developed a major cult following, and to some degree, it seemed like a major influence on the recent Captain Marvel. A lot of people loved this movie, including Samuel L. Jackson, who in an interview said, My dude, I love that movie so much. A movie way ahead of its time, Gina Davis, awesome Charlie Baltimore character. The studio didn't know how to market that film because they didn't know that women like seeing themselves as badasses. I kept saying you need to advertise this thing during the day when women were watching soaps. Whatever, they were like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it's gone on to be like this great cult classic because Gina is so good. And that's part of an interview that he gave to The Undefeated. Gotta agree with Sam here, The Long Kiss Goodnight is a stone cold action classic. It's crazy that the movie wasn't a mega hit and Gina Davis deserves to be every bit as iconic for this part as her contemporaries are. Get back to work. Cheers. To me, this is the best of both worlds as it embraces the awesome over the top excess of the genre, but at the time also sports a rock solid script by the great Shane Black. The premise may seem like old hat in the wake of the Bourne identity, but let's not forget this was 1996 and Matt Damon was still working on the script for Goodwill Hunting and not yet an action hero. Action Stars with Amnesia was actually kind of a fresh idea. Gina Davis is perfect in what's essentially a dual role. As Samantha, the kind-hearted suburban mom she's become in the wake of her amnesia, Davis radiates kindness and stability. But as Charlie, the merciless assassin with bleach blonde hair, she's just as convincing and the moral shading the film evokes, suggesting that there was always a buried element of Samantha in Charlie and vice versa, even if both refuse to acknowledge it, pays off. 
It didn't hurt that she's given an ace sidekick in Samuel Jackson, who was really coming into his own at the time. As the movie starts, you kind of think his wisecracking PA is going to be the tough guy, and he certainly sounds like a Shane Black-style hero, but that's not the case at all. What, are you a Mormon? Yes, I'm a Mormon. That's why I just smoked a pack of Newport and drank three vodka tonics. His Mitch Hennessy is a great creation, and you can see why it became one of his favorite roles. For one thing, he gets the same motherfucker a whole lot, thanks to the R rating, but he's also given a real streak of vulnerability behind his bluster, having a troubled relationship with his son, and serving as Charlie's conscience later in the film, where she has to weigh her maternal responsibilities against being a stone-cold badass. The supporting cast is ace, with Craig Bierko memorably slimy as the movie's big bad, Timothy, the wise-cracking, brutal assassin. Also look for David Morse, who has a memorably sadistic torture scene with Davis, plus Brian Cox in the first of what became a string of character parts for the man in action films of the era. And of course, if you haven't watched it, and you should be, check out his career best turn in Succession on HBO. And you know what? Still my favorite Hannibal Lecter in Manhunter. Gotta say. Don't think you can persuade me with appeals to my intellectual vanity. I don't think I'll persuade you at all. You'll either do it or you won't. As good as Davis and Jackson are, and as tight as the Shane Black script is, the movie works because Rennie Harlan's direction is on point, and in recent years, he's really struggled to reestablish himself. But at the time, he was one of the greatest action directors out there. Perfect example is when the assassin One-Eyed Jack attacks Samantha and her family. The fighting is brutal, the dialogue is cracking, and there's also some gallows humor, such as Chrysalis Carolers singing off-key because he's holding them at gunpoint. It is the best. There's been talk about there potentially being a sequel to this movie, with Rennie Harlan telling Movie Hall, I've created a treatment for a sequel, which where basically, in a nutshell, the story is in the opening sequence, Gina's character is murdered. And her daughter would now be in her early 20s, who was five or six years old in the original, would now be in her 20s. She's in university, after her mother dies, she receives this mysterious package, and there's something in it that she really doesn't understand, and now the government and a couple of bad guys are after her because they have a hunch that her mother sent the item to her. And now she's on the run, and she has no one to turn to, and she's totally in over her head. The only person that knows that could maybe help is Samuel Jackson's character, and then it becomes a road movie. But now it's Sam and Gina's daughter on the road. That's my treatment. Gotta say, Rennie, bad idea, buddy. Bad idea. If you're gonna do a long Kiss Goodnight sequel, you gotta bring back Gina Davis, even though you guys are divorced. There's no long Kiss Goodnight sequel without Gina Davis, just as there's no long Kiss Goodnight sequel without Samuel Jackson. If you wanna see Long Kiss Goodnight, easily available on Blu-ray and digital download, and I have to tell you, this one is a blind buy if you haven't seen it, because it's impossible to just watch the Long Kiss Goodnight once. In fact, it's one of those rare movies I think that gets better the more you watch it. I remember seeing it in theaters with my dad, thinking it was badass, then seeing it on video a couple months later and thinking it was amazing, and then I recently watched it again, and holy shit, this movie's good. I'm gonna watch it a couple of times this holiday season, that's for sure. I vividly remember seeing The Long Kiss Goodnight in theaters with my dad, but I also vividly remember friends of mine mocking me for going to see what they call the chick flick. Idiots. The Long Kiss Goodnight is one of the best action films of the era and a stone cold classic. With all due respect to Rennie Harlan, doing a sequel without Gina Davis would be a disaster. With older action stars all the rage these days, why not give Gina Davis one last go round as Charlie? The Long Kiss Goodnight is one hell of an action movie. Thank you all for watching our show, and if you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow videos channel and tell your friends who like this sort of content to turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support.